Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum, my dear students. Today we are going to talk about Victorian essays. So, as I told you before as well, like uh, when we were talking about Victorian poetry and uh, Victorian novels, and we have discussed some of the aspects of the early Victorian age plus uh, the later Victorian age as well. So, my dear students, uh, today we are going to talk about uh, Victorian essays as well. Okay, this is your lecture number twenty and uh, you know uh, the classes history of english literature concerts virtual campus islamabad okay dear students we are here talking about the victorian prose so you could see like the victorian prose is in keeping with the energetic temperament of the time so as you know that during the victorian period novel was on the peak uh, people they started writing novel a lot as compared to poetry so same is the case with prose over here so that is basically an example of the energetic uh, temperament of uh, that time an expansive energy seems to be characteristics of the whole period displaying itself as freely in literature as in the development of science uh, geographical exploration and the rapidity of economic change so dear students uh, as you know when we were talking about you know the characteristics of the victorian era or the victorian literature so you could see like basically uh, the victorian uh, prose is uh, quite energetic uh, as you could see as uh, science there were a lot of uh, scientific developments uh, going on that that time geographical explorations as well people they were it was quite easy for them to Uh, you know uh, meet each other okay and you can say the economical change in that country so my dear students uh, these all factors they contributed a lot uh, in uh, you can say producing literature of that time science was on peak uh, as i you could see the scientific revolution which was going on at that time plus uh, the economical growth uh, this is an impact of uh, uh, industrialization on the english society at that time so my dear students uh, all these factors they contributed a lot uh, in making literature of that time okay so you could see the a true reflection of all these things in uh, victorian prose of that time okay this energetic mood prescribes the inventiveness and uh, fertility of the prose writers of the period and explains the vitality of so many of their works you could see economical growth was on the top during that period okay scientific and technological advancements uh, were going on plus uh, you could see there were too many explorations as far as the geography of the country is concerned people they started meeting each other so definitely when you talk to many people when you meet many people so definitely it uh, would uh, affect uh, the kind of literature which you are producing okay so here my dear students you could see the names of uh, some of the prose writers of that time one is uh, carlyle basically uh, he talked about the french revolution and the name of the book is as well the french revolution so my dear students uh, the impact of french revolution as well you could see on uh, you know uh, the production of uh, victorian literature of that time okay and another prose writer of that time is ruskin you could see his writing modern painters and arnold's essays in criticism are not modest and light hearted compositions but they represent the aesthetic equivalent of self assertion and an urgent will to survive which was characteristics of the early victorians so my dear students uh, when you, you talk about uh, victorian prose you could see although these uh, works is these are not uh, that much modest okay like uh, they highlighted uh, you can say the pe mistakes people commit in everyday life uh, in a very rude way in these writings so my dear students when you talk about them so these are not at all modest writings so you could see although these are you could, uh, the uh, the elements which are present there in their writings are uh, you could see the will to survive that is there like you'll have to survive in that society okay in that particular society if you are happy or not you'll have to cope up with the industrialization of the country you'll have to go with the scientific advan advancements of the country my dear students you could see 
people uh, during the Victorian period they were uh, quite in a in an inferiority complex at that time like uh, they found themselves uh, nowhere in this in the age of science and technology due to the impact of industrialization okay so you could see uh, like uh, how uh, the shift of classes uh, w was also there in the Victorian era because uh, the landless class of the country they became the working class when they migrated to the city side in order to earn something okay from different industries so that is why you could see the shift of the class as well so my dear students basically uh, you could see like self exhaustion elements which are present there during that period so the true depiction of uh, those elements uh, in the literature of that time their prose is not as a rule flawless in diction and uh, rhythm are easily related to a central standard of correctness or polished to a uniform high finish but it is a prose which is vigorous intricate and ample and is more conscious of vocabulary and imagery than of balance and rhythm okay dear students so basically they focused on uh, you know vocabulary and uh, imagery a lot as compared to the rules and regulations which people they'll have to follow in order to produce any kind of prose so here you could see two terminologies one is balance and the other one is rhythm these are the you can say poetic terms as well so basically as you know these are the prose writers so they were uh, against writing uh, poetry because according to them writing poetry is of no use at all because the ordinary people of the society they do not understand uh, what is written there because uh, the expression of poetry is quite complicated so dear students when we talk about prose uh, novels uh, or different essays uh, during the era so at that time people used to think that it is more easy to convey your thoughts your ideas and your feelings to the common people to the ordinary people of the society in form of uh, these things as compared to poetry okay so that is why they were quite towards uh, using vocabulary and imagery in their poem as compared to balance and rhythm okay the dominant impression of zestful and uh, workman like prose at that time uh, people they were engaged in working at different industries so they were quite affiliated with those with those industries at that time so dear students here you can say like a, an element of zestful and workman like prose so basically victorian poetry is or victorian prose is a true depiction of the society so people they were associated with the with the industries of that time so you could see that element in their prose as well okay as the number of prose writers during the period is quite large there is a great variety of style among them than to be found in any other period so my dear students here you can see like uh, along with the the peak time of uh, novels during that time uh, prose was uh, also on a very higher position over here okay people produced a lot of work during the victorian era okay in the absence any well defined tradition of prose writing each writer cherishes his uh, oddities and idiosyncrasies and is not prepared to sacrifice his peculiarities uh, in deference uh, to a received tradition okay so dear students uh, basically people they focused on their individual style at that time plus uh, they did not forget the element of uh, idiosyncrasy from their poems okay so in order to you know uh, write any kind of prose they were they were allowed to follow any kind of uh, tradition so at that time people started why people started writing novels and prose a lot because uh, they didn't have to follow any kind of rules and regulations uh, so they had uh, freedom while writing prose and novels okay so the received tradition over here like when you talk about uh, the previous era or you can say the medieval ages or the elizabethan ages so my dear students 
writers they had to follow certain rules and regulations or a set of rules in order to produce any kind of work so as far as the victorian uh, prose is concerned people they were quite liberal and they were quite free as well to follow any kind of uh, style okay so uh, basically they didn't have to follow any kind of uh, specific tradition while producing prose okay Victorian individualism, the doing as one likes, uh, censored by Matthew Arnold, uh, reverberates in prose style. So you could see uh, Victorian individualism was also very much uh, present in their writings. Uh, so you could see in this uh, work by Matthew Arnold, doing as one's likes, so as the v as the very name of uh, this work suggests you like uh, people they didn't have to follow the you know specific kinds of traditions at that time while writing prose okay so you can see the element of individuality in their work so the work of one author would be different from another one so you cannot find uh, uniformity in their work as such that is why victorian literature is quite uh, difficult to understand as far as the romantic literature medieval literature or elizabethan literature is concerned so if you uh, are just uh, quite familiar with the rules and regulations which people they were for they were following at that time so the idea would be clear to you but as far as the victorian literature is concerned why this is uh, you can say a period of transition a period of change a period of uh, individualism in the history of english literature because uh, writers they were not restricted to follow any kind of style so the element of individuality is very much present in their works uh, so in order to understand any kind of work which is written during the victorian period so definitely you'll have to uh, read a lot of uh, you can say works uh, relevant to that very work okay so uh, a rich variety of uh, uh, english literature you can find out in the victorian period okay taking the victorian period as a whole we can say that it is romantic prose the romanticism gave a new direction to english poetry between 1780 and 1830 its full effects on prose were delayed until the 1830s when all the major romantic poets were either dead or marebun that is why early victorian prose is properly speaking romantic prose and carolyn is the best example of the romantic prose artist so dear students as you could see different eras they are associated with the previous eras or the future eras so here victor as far as the uh, nature of the victorian prose is concerned that is quite uh, romantic so my dear students you could see the elements of romanticism over here like uh, as it gave a new direction in english poetry like you will have to focus on nature on human beings on beauty on romance on love so my dear students again you can see like these traditions are being followed during the victorian era as far as the prose of that time is concerned so my dear students when we were talking about uh, the poets in the later half of the victorian period so you could see that was a, there was a kind of a new revival of romantic spirit once more in the victorian era so here as far as you could see the themes of the prose is concerned so they were following the romantic traditions over here as well in the victorian period so you could see the name of uh, you can say the best uh, uh, author over here in prose writing so his name is carlyle and he is the the best example of a romantic prose artist okay in fact it was the romantic elements uh, unevenness the seriousness of tone concreteness and popularity which constitute the underlying unity of the prose of the early victorian period all the great prose writers of period for example carlyle ruskin macaulay and matthew arnold have these qualities in common so my dear students let me underline some few things uh, for you people one is uh, what were basically the uh, romantic elements which were present in prose uh, of the victorian era you could see unevenness seriousness of tone that is very much present there concreteness and uh, 
particularity so my dear students uh, here we are basically talking about the embodied experience of the writers okay whatever you experience you put it you write it down in form of uh, poetry so that was the romantic spirit okay so as far as uh, you can say the prose uh, uh, writers of uh, the victorian period they are concerned they were following the same traditions of the romantic writers so these are some of the qualities of the romantic literature for example unevenness uh, seriousness of tone and concreteness so th this is not only about your abstract thoughts or the abstract ideas or not only about imagination definitely you'll have to attach or relate your imagination with your experiences as well whatever you experience so that is uh, your poetry is a reflection of your embodied experience so that is their philosophy and particularity as well okay so you could see these elements are very much present in the works uh, which were done by Carlyle, Ruskin, Macaulay and Matthew Arnold. Okay? My dear students here that was uh, an introdu introduction to the Victorian prose. Uh, you could see the uh, romantic once more the revival of the romantic spirit over here. My dear students uh, prose right uh, we I just told you the names of the different uh, eminent prose writers uh, of the Victorian period as well okay my dear students uh, basically our focus here is on this style okay so uh, the traditions which uh, Victorian uh, period prose writers uh, they were following those are very much you can say similar to the romantic traditions okay basically they focused on vocabulary and on symbolism on imagination as compared to uh, you know balance and rhythm okay like uh, uh, during the Shakespearean times you could see people they had to follow many traditions in order to produce any kind of uh, poetry so my dear students here people they were quite liberal they can produce any kind of uh, prose so that is why you could see prose and novel both were on the top of position during the Victorian period why because people they had quite a lot of freedom and uh, you can say liberty they can go in whatever direction they want to so the element of individuality are very much present uh, over there and uh, you, you could see people uh, they didn't have to follow many rules and regulations or a set of rules uh, which is in front of them and they cannot violate those rules and regulations uh, so you could see everybody whosoever wants to write anything during the Victorian period you could see they could do it okay so on the other hand uh, as far as the reader is concerned so uh, that is a bit difficult for him or her to understand to analyze to comment on Victorian pro prose or Victorian novels because uh, there are too many you can say individuals who were working uh, on novels on prose so my dear students basically the thing which uh, which uh, uh, is problematic for the readers even today that is uh, you can say the lack of uh, uniformity because uh, people they were not supposed to uh, do anything according to the rules and regulations okay so my dear students uh, in order to analyze in order to appreciate or to encourage any of the prose work uh, that was written during the Victorian period that is not easy to understand okay so you'll have to, because you cannot find the relationship of uh, that text with any other one okay for example when you talk about the romantic era people they were following you can say quite uh, alike uh, themes uh, during that period and their style was also to some extent uh, you can say similar to each other okay or the Elizabethan uh, age when uh, writers they were uh, producing different kinds of uh, tragedies and comedies by following the Greek tradition okay or you can say the Aristotle poetics was also very much common so here you you won't be able to find out uh, any work which could provide you the basis to analyze the Victorian period unless uh, you uh, you analyze that work on your own by keeping in view uh, the autobiographical elements of the 
personality of uh, the writer there plus um, she'll have to come up with the uh, you know analysis of the psychology of the writer plus the overall circumstances uh, of uh, you know the society or the kind of uh, background which the writer has okay on the other hand you cannot say like uh, any prose writer who is uh, uh, relevant to Victorian era that would be similar to the other author okay in order to analyze different prose writers of that era so you what you have to keep in mind the element of individuality is very much there plus uh, they were following uh, uh, to some extent uh, the romanticism doctrines of writing poetry because they were quite close to nature once more as far as the prose writings are concerned plus um, they were very much fascinated by uh, the use of symbolism in their uh, you know writings uh, plus they focused on vocabulary and uh, imagery in their writings as compared to balance and rhythm these are the poetic uh, devices or the poetic rules uh, okay so basically they just violated the concept of uh, presenting your ideas in an abstract in an, in a complicated way so writers they were quite uh, liberal and free to follow any kind of uh, tradition at that time my dear students uh, uh, here that was basically an introduction to the Victorian essays or the prose writers of the Victorian era. So my dear students, uh, you could see the impact of romanticism on their work plus the distinctive features of uh, that era as well. My dear students, uh, you could see like uh, when you talk about the early half of the Victorian period, people they were quite rigid okay so uh, they uh, just wanted to present uh, the society the Victorian society in their writings uh, all the time so before that when we were talking about romanticism so my dear students at that time people were quite close to nature to uh, imagination to inspiration so my dear students here once more uh, you can say as far as uh, the prose writings of the Victorian period are concerned the revival of the romantic spirit in prose writing so my dear students these are some of the names of the eminent writers prose writers of that time so now we are going to talk about uh, their writings in detail okay so my dear students uh, will talk about their writings along with other eminent writers of the uh, Victorian era as well so my dear students uh, as you uh, you know that uh, there w there is one more moment the Oxford movement which was going on in England uh, like as far as the literature is concerned though, so we'll talk about the effect of uh, you know the Oxford movement as well on literature and will focus on the writings of a new man on John Stott Mill okay so basically here when you talk about the prose writers uh, of that era uh, you know the Victorian period so you you could not find out the elements of uniformity in their writings so in order to understand the writings uh, or the prose works which were done by the uh, Victorian uh, you know writers so you'll have to keep in mind the elements of individuality like uh, the psychological factors which are involved in the formulation of text uh, plus the sociological factor the background of uh, the writer okay so by keeping in view you are not here uh, talking about the text in relation to other texts like the element of intertextuality is not present here so you are looking at the text itself like uh, individually okay so my dear students basically these are some of the aspects which are very much common and you can say the tradition which was which was uh, being followed during the Victorian era okay like uh, uh, people they were quite uh, you can say free and uh, they were not limited to follow certain kinds of uh, rules uh, during that time so what was basically the reason there was uh, a shift of class and people were quite uh, in, in an inferiority complex at that time they didn't find themselves anywhere in the world of science and technology plus uh, there was uh, a rise uh, you can say as far as the economics of the country is concerned so my dear students uh, basically at that time there was quite a hustle and bustle in the society chaos in the society so people uh, they didn't have to follow the rules at that time there wasn't any kind of uh, school or you can say the school po poet school at that time who uh, could tell them like uh, this these uh, this is the book you will have to follow and this is a set of rules uh, which you have to follow so by keeping in view the situation of England at that time so basically that was uh, that was one of 
the reasons why people they were quite liberal so basically this can be the reason uh, behind it okay another reason which was uh, uh, there at that time by like people uh, they moved from uh, the rural areas to the urban areas of England at that time in order to get uh, you can say employment in different factories uh, there in the urban areas so my dear students uh, when they moved over there so they saw a new world of science and technology and uh, previously they were living in the villages over there so my dear students they also started uh, coming in uh, you know writing literature so you could see like uh, literature was not restricted to any elite class of the society or to any religious class of the society of that time so it was basically for everybody over there so that is why you can see the rise of prose and uh, novel as well during that period because uh, layman was also involved in writing literature so you could see formal education was there in England during the Victorian period so my dear students that is also one of the reasons people they were quite uh, you can say interested in uh, writing prose and uh, novel so my dear students by keeping in view all the doctrines all the philosophies of the Victorian period like what were basically the reasons behind uh, producing any kind of uh, text at that time the idea would be clear to you so in future when you are you will be analyzing prose works uh, that is written by different authors so you'll have to keep in mind the element of individuality over there because you won't find any kind of uh, universal uh, rules and regulations uh, relevant to that very era anywhere so that can be problematic for you as well but to some extent that that leads you you know towards creativity how to judge any uh, work on its own when you do not have anything on your own so here you can have a margin of uh, interpreting the things so it's totally up to you my dear students usually we say that literature is your interpretation basically so here this is not only writer who is involved in the formulation of text it is the personality of the reader who is interpreting the text so you can see a stanza that is in front of you that can be interpreted in more than 100 ways so basically it depends upon the knowledge or upon the background of the reader who is reading that very stanza so same is the case here with the novels and the prose so here it's totally up to you the way you analyze the thing so you can show your creativity here while analyzing Victorian uh, era prose so my dear students these are some of the elements which are present there during that era by keeping in view all the elements like uh, the kind of chaos which was uh, there in the Victorian society like uh, the new revival of the romanticism once more in uh, Victorian essays as well and uh, you can say the doctrines of uh, the Victorian prose writers at that time plus uh, the way they were formulating the text like they focused on vocabulary and on imagery a lot as compared to balance and rhythm the idea would be clear to you when we will talk about the writings of uh, different authors prose writers okay so basically the concept you'll have to keep in mind what basically were the reasons uh, uh, for the rise of uh, prose and novel during that time plus uh, the fall of uh, you can say poetry as poetry was on the very top of position in the previous era that is known as the romantic era so my dear students what basically like you could see the revolution in uh, literature as well previously uh, we focused on poetry uh, a lot uh, in the romantic era here our focus is on prose uh, writings and novels okay so here you could see different genres of literature when they are on the top of position what basically are the reasons behind it according to romanticism like uh, you can convey your thoughts your, your spontaneous you can say thoughts in poetry in a better way so you could see um, a group of poets who was working for poetry at that time uh, it was there here you you'll see a lot of prose writers a lot of novelists uh, in the Victorian period I told you the reasons why due to the influence of science on common people because of uh, industrialization there because of French Revolution because of you can say women empowerment in the society you'll see
uh, different novelists as well during that peri period. So my dear students, uh, it was, uh, you can say, all about uh, uh, Victorian uh, prose. So now we are going to talk about uh, some of the eminent writer, prose writers of the Victorian period. Okay. Okay, first name uh, which is very much uh, important as far as uh, essay writing or, or prose, uh, uh, you know, writers are concerned. The name of the author is uh, Thomas Carlyle. Okay, so he was uh, born on December, uh, you know, four uh, December, seventeen ninety-five, and he was died on fifth February, eighteen eighty-one. He was a Scottish historical writer, essayist, historian, and teacher during the Victorian era. So basically, he was again. You can see like a Victorian. Why Victorian era is very much important in the history of English literature. So you could see over here, like uh, here, you you are uh, uh, watching, you know, certain Italian writers plus Scottish, Scottish writers as well. So what is historical writer like who highlights uh, the negative aspects of the society in a way, like uh, in a humorous way, in a comical way? Fine. So my dear students uh, here you will see like a variety of uh, authors here from different uh, areas of the world having different backgrounds okay and he was uh, assessed as well historian and teacher during the Victorian era so basically he talked about uh, history he wrote certain essays and uh, his work is basically a satire on the Victorian society okay as uh, previously we were talking about uh, you know novels and the uh, poetry in the Victorian era as well he called economics the dismal science uh, okay wrote articles for the Eden Burke encyclopedia and became a controversial social commentator as well so my dear students here you can just notice down one thing like uh, okay a dismal science uh, that is um, you know a gloomy kind of uh, science which is not clear okay my dear students as you could see like uh, uh, many authors uh, they they worked for you know the uh, equal power uh, relationships of power and equal distribution of power in the society so he's also one of them who wrote that economics is a dismal science okay so this is a gloomy science this is a you know a dep depressed kind of a thing as well okay so he wrote certain articles for Edinburgh Encyclopedia as well and he uh, he became a controversial social commentator as well so he always uh, wrote in a controversial way that is why he he was known with this name controversial social commentator okay Com coming from a strict uh, Calvinist family Khalil was expected to become a preacher by his parents so basically he was asked by his parents to follow the religious practices and to preach their religion but while at the University of Edinburgh he lost his Christian faith so basically he was a Christian but he lost his Christian faith due to certain circumstances in the University of Edinburgh Calvinist values however remained with him throughout his uh, life so my dear students here you could see like some of the values uh, he kept uh, with him throughout his life but not all of the things this combination of a religious temperament uh, with the loss of faith uh, in uh, traditional Christianity made Carlyle works appealing to many Victorians who are grappling with scientific and political changes that threaten the traditional social order. So basically, in his works, you could see an essence of, um, you know, scientific and political changes as well, whatever was hap happening there in the Victorian age. So you could see over there in his works, okay, uh, and all the changes uh, that threaten the traditional social order. So you could see all these things in his, uh, you know, writings. Okay, my dear students, here you will see like uh, some of the aspects which are very much important. One thing, like he was against economics and he called economic the dismissal thing because the, uh, you know, distribution of uh, money was not equal in the society. That is why he called economics a, uh, a gloomy thing, okay? Another thing is like he was basically uh, a Christian, but he did not uh, follow, okay? So basically, uh, his writings are full of uh, different uh, controversial social, uh, you know, uh, commentaries and many other things. Like uh, as I told you, he was uh, uh, he lost his Christian faith. Uh, he was a Calvinist as well. So my dear students, uh, here you will see the religious temperament in his writing plus uh, uh, his uh, uh, rebellious attitude towards the economics, uh, economical status of the country, plus uh, you know the political changes which were going on and the scientific uh, era. So these are the characteristics of the Victorian age as well so basically you can say his attitude was quite rebellious when he talked about uh, you know uh, these uh, 
dimensions in his writings okay okay my dear students here you can see like uh, in 1821 Car Carlyle had abandoned the clergy as a uh, as a possible career and focused on making a life as a writer so for the very first time in 1821 he decided uh, uh, to become a writer okay his first attempt at fiction was uh, Cruthers and Johnson, one of several abortive attempts at writing a novel. So basically this was uh, uh, his uh, writing, his first writing you could say and that is uh, a fictional writing as well and uh, he attempts to uh, write a novel for the first time and this is the name of the novel Cruthers and Johnson. Okay. Okay, following his work on a translation of Goethe's uh, uh, Wilhelm Meister's uh, apprenticeship, he came to this trust the form of the realistic novel and so worked on developing a new form of fiction fiction so basically um, he diverted his attention from uh, you know writing uh, so my dear students here you can could see like previously he wrote a novel and then uh, you know um, uh, then he planned to form another kind of fiction, fiction and uh, you, you know he translated the work of Goethe's uh, okay, William Mister's, uh, Mister's Apprenticeship. So this is basically the work uh, which he translated. Okay. In addition to his essays on German literature, he branched out into wider range in commentary on modern culture in his influential essays, Signs of the Times and Characteristics. So basically this is his, uh, uh, you know, these are his essays, very influential essays, which, uh, you know, which is basically a commentary on modern culture of that time. So my dear students here, again, you could see like uh, in Victorian age, most of the writers, they were against the com contemporary society of uh, that time. And uh, they they did not, uh, you know, they were not following any kind of, uh, you know, certain traditions, any set patterns uh, of that time. So, my dear students, here you will have to focus on one thing like this uh, writer, this essayist, uh, you know, is against the modern culture again, okay? And basically, he is that is why he is known as a controversial, uh, you know, commentator as well, who always, uh, you know, mm, comes, uh, comes up with different controversies and, you know, discusses everything in a controversial way about the society. So, this this is one thing okay and these influential essays are signs of the times and uh, characteristics as well so basically this these are his two essays which uh, got very much popularity so as the very name suggests you the signs of the time okay and characteristics as well so basically these are the characteristics of the society and signs of the times signs of that Victorian age would be here in this essay okay so this is uh, again a commentary this is uh, a kind of uh, debate as well all right later writings were generally short essays often indicating the hardening of uh, carlyle's political position so basically here these is later essays these are, they are based on the political issues okay his notoriously racist essay occasional discourse on the negro question so basically this is uh, uh, his uh, racist essay he talked about race in it so here my dear students if you want to analyze this essay so this is a negro question as well okay occasional discourse so basically it comes in discourse analysis this kind of uh, essay so occasional discourse on the negro question so basically this is a uh, you know uh, about occasional discourse uh, uh, on the negro question it means like a negro that is uh, a race and you know the other dominating races in the society they are depressing uh, this race very much so this is a negro question from the other races as well the dominating races from the society as well okay so suggested that slavery should have been abolished and else replaced with serfdom so basically uh, this is about slavery okay he was very much against slavery as i told you like uh, this is a racist essay as well so my dear students here you could see like uh, he, he thinks like it should be uh, replaced with the uh, freedom with the uh, liberty okay it had kept order he argued and forced to work from people who would otherwise have been lazy and feckless so he had that ability to take uh, 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 help from the people and to make them work to make them engaged in a certain actions so, okay my dear students here you could see uh, one more thing like he had that ability to take help from uh, those people who were very lazy and they were feckless as well okay this and Carl's uh, support for the repressive mayor of governance Edward Eyre in uh, uh, Jamaica 
further alienated him okay from his own liberal uh, allies ira had been accused for you know uh, brutal uh, lynchings with while suppressing a rebellion so ira had been accused for brutal uh, lynching while suppressing a rebellion uh, carlyle set up a committee to defend ira while mill organized for his uh, prosecution so basically this is uh, the whole story of you know uh, uh, this uh, like the way this uh, supported uh, the, you know, the repressive mayor of uh, governor edward ire so basically he was uh, in favor of you know um, uh, edward ire okay so basically suppressing uh, rebellion here over here you could see like uh, most of the people they were rebel in the victorian society so my dear students here you will have to focus on one thing eh? like the the powerful authorities of the society they were just uh, uh, you can say suppressing uh, the lower authorities or you can say the lower class of the society the power the powerful uh, were becoming more and more powerful with the passage of time and on the other hand they were uh, taking the rights of the lower class society so basically all the writers they took a stand against the values and the norms in the victorian age so they took a step while writing essays and they mentioned it in their poetry as well that what is basically happening in that society so same is the case with essays over here so this is basically again a rebellious attitude of the writers uh, while writing their essays all right okay my dear students uh, another essayist uh, in the victorian period is john henry newman and he was born on uh, you know 24th february 1801 and he died on 11th august 1890 also referred to as cardinal newman and blessed john henry newman so this is these are basically his uh, names okay was an important figure in the religious history of england in the 19th century he was n known nationally nationally by the mid uh, 1830 so basically he is uh, uh, he has uh, a strong name in the religious history of uh, england i'll tell you why and we'll talk about his writings as well originally so my dear students basically uh, he was an uh, evangelic oxford academic and clergyman in the church of uh, england so that is why he was very much associated with the religious practices of england as well newman was a leader in the oxford movement so here you can see like a uh, oxford movement along with the, the leader of the church as well so my dear students here like he was a clergyman in the church plus uh, he was uh, the leader in the oxford movement as well so here you are taking two different aspects together one is uh, that of religion and the other one is uh, you know uh, the political aspect. aspect of his life this influential grouping of anglican wish to turn the church of england to many catholic beliefs and forms of worship so basically he returned the catholic uh, you know he returned the the church to the uh, catholics okay so basically this was uh, the point there he left the anglican church and converted to uh, roman catholicism so basically previously he was uh, an anglican so he converted to roman catholicism in 1845 so my dear students here i hope you are my getting my point previously he was a uh, you know uh, uh, he was an Ang anglican and now here we are talking about 1845 so he is a roman catholic over here eventually being granted uh, granted the rank of cardinal by pope leo you know 13 so my dear students here you can see like a uh, cardinal newman or blessed john henry newman so these are some titles of uh, john henry newman he was an essays during the victorian period so basically pope leo 13 gave him this name Uh, let's talk something uh, uh, about his writings so what are basically his writings uh, during the victorian age mm. some of newman's short and earlier poems are described by r h hutton as unequal for grandeur of outline purity of taste and radiance of total effect while his latest poem and longest uh, the dream of uh, gerontius attempts to represent the unseen world along the same lines as uh, dante okay his prose style is precisely in his catholic days is fresh and vigorous and is attractive to many who do not sympathize uh, with the, his conclusions from the apparent candor with which difficulties are admitted and grappled 
while in his private correspondence there is charm so my dear students here you can see like uh, basically uh, if we talk about uh, you know a new man uh, uh, you know he was basically a right uh, he was basically a poet as well okay so basically when we talk about his short and early poems so these are described by rhn as unequaled for grandeur of outline purity of taste and radiance of total effect so basically they they're not fulfilling the purpose of all the things over here okay he also published as i told you previously we were talking about his poems a set of poems so here he also published a set of lectures entitled the idea of a university so basically this is his lecture okay this is about the idea of the university might be when the universities were being introduced like women university was were being introduced in england so might be he, he wrote this essay during that time james joyce had a lifelong admiration for women's writing so basically james joyce uh, was very much impressed uh, by his writing style and in letter to his uh, pattern Harriet Shaw Vavier humorously remarked about Newman that nobody has ever written English prose that can be compared with that of a tiresome uh, footling uh, little Anglican person who afterward became a prince of the only true child so basically here you can see the symbolic uh, so my dear students here uh, Harriet Shaw uh, you know uh, James Joyce uh, when he was a uh, Uh, writing a letter to his pattern Harriet Shaw Weaver so he humorously admired you know Newman as well that he was uh, a very great uh, Anglican person who afterwards became a prince of the only uh, uh, only two choice so basically again you can say like he was uh, uh, the you know um, clergyman in a church so basically he is referring to his that position so my dear students here you'll have to focus on one thing uh, like um, he called him footling little anglican person who afterwards like uh, became a prince so basically he was a little anglican person but later on uh, when you know he converted might be converted his religion so he became a prince uh, in that very church okay another important figure in the history of english literature as far as uh, prose writing is concerned in uh, you know the victorian era so you could see a name over here that is john stott mill okay he was uh, born in 1806 and died in 1837 raised as a utilitarian but later influenced by the work of wordsworth he opposed the utilitarian point of view of the times put uh, forth by jeremy bentham who thought that poetry stimulated the patience and prejudices and that it was therefore socially harmful so my dear students here you can see like uh, he is basically against the point uh, like, like utilitarian point of view of the times uh, which was which was defended by jeremy bentham like uh, poetry what is poetry that is stimulation of the patients and prejudices and it was therefore socially harmful so basically usually people used to think uh, during that uh, time like uh, poetry is harmful for society so my dear students here you could see like he is uh, very much against this tradition and for the like uh, he okay my dear students here you could see like uh, he defended his point very much and he was uh, you know uh, of the words what we again over here as well like uh, my dear students uh, like uh, when we were doing uh, romanticism you could see like they were quite uh, uh, you know uh, near to nature to love to romance so my dear students uh, like uh, according to wordsworth like uh, poetry is a spontaneous overflow of the powerful um, uh, emotions so poetry is uh, like uh, this is all about emotions this is all about your feelings and thoughts this is uh, Uh, not at all socially harmful so basically here you are taking uh, two uh, we are taking two points together one is uh, a utilitarian point of view and the other one is the romantic point of view so john stuart mill was in favor of uh, what words what said about poetry this seems like an ongoing argument that can be traced from plato's republic uh, Uh, all the way to the US Senate subcommittee at the national endowment of the uh, for the arts someone's always accusing poetry of either volatile uh, subversive or just uh, immoral purposes so my dear students here here you can see like he was not uh, the only person who uh, you know who was against poetry that this is uh, uh, you know socially abusive or this is uh, socially harmful there are many other people as well like if you could trace uh, you know um, plato's republic so the same concept is over there 
तो अनदर कॉन्सेप्ट दैट इज दैट वाज प्रेजेंटेड इन यूएस सेनेट सब कमेटी ऑन द नेशनल एनवायरनमेंट ऑफ द आर सो बेसिकली दैट इज अबाउट द आर समवन ऑलवेज एक्यूजिंग पोएट्री फॉर इदर वोलेटाइल सबवर्सिव और दिस ही वाज अगेंस्ट दिस पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू दैट पोएट्री इज नॉट यूज्ड फॉर इमोरल पर्पसेस सो दिस इज वेरी मच यू नो शोन थ्रू हिज एसेस एंड यू नो अदर राइटिंग्स ओके माय डियर स्टूडेंट्स यू जस्ट हैव टू कीप इन माइंड द यूटिलिटेरियन पर्पस plus uh, you know uh, uh, words what uh, you know uh, definition of poetry as well okay for him poetry is not at all uh, uh, immoral this is like it teaches you morality and it teaches you how to live in the society on the other hand if we go for uh, you know other point of view like jeremy bentham he said that uh, you know poetry uh, is okay stimulated the passions and prejudices and that it was therefore socially harmful so my dear students here my focus is on two points one is socially harmful and the other one is immoral purposes so according to them according to the utilitarians like poetry is used to harm the society it is used for immoral purposes as well so my dear student john stott mill he defended his point and he was of the view which wordsworth gave Mel's argument for poetry so again we are uh, you know here he talked about uh, you know uh, he gave all these arguments uh, for poetry in his uh, you know uh, prose okay in discussing how people know the difference between something that is specific and th something that is not mill says the appearance of a difference is itself uh, a real difference so basically what is uh, you know uh, on the upper layer what is uh, you know you can say the what is difference the appearance of that difference is itself uh, uh, a real difference uh, this is an interesting statement he basically says that once something is said or implied or even if it is not true necessarily the question is out there for and discussion so still it is say like uh, if you are saying something or you are implying something so if it that is uh, true or that is not true the question is out there for discussion like when you are discussing the thing when you are analyzing the thing in order to judge either something is true or not still that is a kind of uh, discussion okay so he suggests uh, that the difference in in, in emphasis between the novel and poetry is so great that the forms are almost mutually exclusive okay and he even wonders how those who really appreciate one could care at all about the other while he says uh, that many of the finest poems are in form of novels and in almost all good novels there is true poetry The difference between the two is that the novel is derived from incident where poetry comes from a representation of feeling. He goes so far as to suggest that the epic poetry is not really poetry at all. So basically he is uh, rejecting the idea of the epic poetry a long narrative kind of uh, poetry that is not poetry at all on the other hand if we just talk about the comparison of a uh, novel and poetry over here so according to mill my dear students here we are talking about john john stott mill so you could see over here like a uh, a novel is basically derived from incident like uh, from the incidents of your life so you start writing a novel here he is pointing out uh, the novelist of the victorian era okay and uh, on the other hand poetry comes from a representation of feeling so here incident and feeling so my dear student you will have to draw a comparison and the ideas would be quite clear to you like okay what mill mill says about poetry in his writings okay my dear students here Uh, like he says like many of the finest poems are in the form of novels so basically he is uh, he say he says that we cannot uh, write a novel if we and if we do not add any kind of poem in that one fine so uh, and in almost uh, many of the finest poems so my dear students here my focus is on this uh, you know wording that is by mill that many of the finest poems are in form of novel so basically this is a form of uh, you know in form of feeling plus incident over here he is talking about this thing okay and the other thing is the difference between the two is that the novel is derived from incident okay the same thing which i already have told you novel is incident on the other hand poetry is feeling so my dear Dear students, he says that novel and poems they go side by side because uh, we cannot write. Uh, okay, my dear students, in most of his essays, uh, he talks about uh, you know uh, in favor of uh, poetry. So, my dear students, here you could see like uh, uh, he talked about uh, the difference between novel and uh, you know poetry as well. Novel is basically uh, all about uh, incidents of the life. On the other hand, uh, poetry is about 
feelings and uh, in one quotation is also saying like a uh, novel and uh, poems they go side by side okay when he was uh, saying that many of the finest poems are in form of novels and in almost all good novels there is true poetry so here my dear students you could see like uh, as far as the form and the themes of poetry and novels are concerned they go side by side according to mel okay uh, he talks about the difference between description in poetry and other kinds of writing sayings that fiction or science would try to convey the truth about the outward appearance of sayings. So my dear students uh, here, he is comparing uh, or you can say, uh, you know, uh, saying that fiction and science both are equal to each other and they just go for the, uh, you know, outward appearance of the things. Poetry on the other hand may not describe the outward appearance accurately, it would not even try while well, describe the thing in a way that the emotion produced by it are redundant with scopeless truth so basically it is uh, revealing your emotions okay previously this is like uh, when we talk about fiction or when we talk about science so this is just to uh, reveal the appearance of the things so here when we talk about uh, you know poetry so my dear students here you can say this is uh, revealing the truth okay this is not only about uh, uh, highlighting the appearance or just to search what is basically hidden in the appearance so it goes into the details and in order to find out the truth and the facts from the thing he grants that poetry is impassioned truth but says that cannot be all uh, it is because this is a, a description of uh, eloquence which is also present in philosophy among other things so basically he is trying to introduce one more concept previously we took a start from the comparison of novel and uh, you know um, poetry here then we move towards uh, science and fiction and then poetry and then here again this is poetry and philosophy the difference he suggests is that uh, eloquence is heard poetry is overheard Eloquence is specifically meant to move an audience while poetry is like hearing private thoughts. So basically he is uh, in favor of uh, writing poetry more. And uh, here he uses a gorgeous line, poetry is feeling conversing itself to itself. So here you can see John Stott Mill is not much, much easy to understand because uh, you know whatever he says there is uh, a hidden reality behind his words as well. So here you can see Poetry is feeling, confessing itself to itself. So my dear student, this is like if you go, just go for the uh, surface meaning of the sentence, so it means something else, but uh, you'll have to analyze uh, everything, whatever he says or other critics they say in their writing. So you'll have to analyze them while going into the deeper meaning, okay? The act of poetry makes it uh, soliloquy. He uses a simile to acting uh, by suggesting that if an actor is too aware of the audience, he will deliver a bad performance. Okay, The same is true of a poet. He has to write for himself alone even if he plans to publish it because the moment he begins to write for someone else, the work becomes non-poetic but eloquent so my dear students here you could see like uh, he is saying soliloquy when uh, uh, there are certain soliloquies in uh, shakespearean dramas and other dramas as well when the main character or any character of of uh, the drama is talking to himself okay so there is a kind of you know conversation between a uh, uh, man and himself right? so he he has compared actor with a poet as well okay so like if an actor is aware of uh, the audience he will deliver a bad performance so basically uh, the character or uh, you can say the actor has to keep in mind that nobody is looking at him so in this way he, he would be more spontaneous more natural okay so he is uh, trying to compare poet with the actor so he's saying the same is true for for poets like if you are writing poetry for somebody else so definitely it won't give uh, that kind of uh, you can say impression which you wanted to create so poet has to write for himself first then you know he can publish it later on but on the initial level when he is in the right in the process of uh, writing any kind of uh, poem so basically he has to write it for himself okay so he is saying that when he the moment he starts uh, writing for somebody else uh, so the work uh, becomes known poetic so he is saying like this is not poetry when you write it for somebody else but uh, uh, eloquent as well okay so my dear students here you just have to keep in mind uh, like uh, uh, the start of the discussion we talked about you know novel and poetry and then you know 
here we are uh, again uh, you know towards the truth what is basically true and we draw a comparison uh, of fiction or science with poetry and then uh, what basically is poetry and then uh, you know you can see like Mel uh, compared you know um, actor with the poet and if you know about the audience so definitely you can give bad performance then so basically po uh, poet has to keep in mind that he is writing whatever is for himself not for somebody else otherwise he would be conscious like somebody would be hearing it so my dear students here like in order to be spontaneous and natural one has to keep in mind that this writing is for himself nobody is going to read it or nobody is going to hear it so this is basically Mel's argument for poetry my dear students let me remind you here we are talking about uh, Victorian age essayist okay so we are here on so that was all about John Stuart Mill another essayist uh, or the prose writer in uh, Victorian period is John Ruskin okay his early life I'll just uh, give you uh, you know a brief description of his early life he was born in 1819 in London to a wine merchant and a strict uh, evangelical mother to a wine merchant and strict evangelical mother spent time in isolation uh, and with few toys only traveled to the continent at age six uh, published first poem at the age of 11 graduated from oxford in 1842 after a period of illness okay married to euphemia a gray in 1848 okay ruskin and turner 1836 wrote an essay defending j m W. Turner. Okay, so basically, this is uh, you know uh, a romantic uh, uh, landscape or, or uh, artist. So he wrote an essay in order to. Okay, my dear students, here you can say like begin modern painters in response to attacks on Turner. So basically, these are his uh, you know works which are relevant to Turner. Okay, so in the first one he defended uh, J. M. W. Turner, and uh, you know uh, you can see uh, the life uh, period of uh, Turner as well. Okay. So he began modern painters in response to attack on Turner. Okay, so basically this is uh, uh, the city of uh, Turner as well. You could see in the picture. Okay, the fighting Tamirier. So this is another work uh, done by John Ruskin. Okay, rain, steam, and speed. The great, great Western Railway. So another thing. Okay, the fighting uh, Temerier. This is uh, uh, a publication uh, by. Okay, this is a publication by John Ruskin, and he published it in 1839. Okay, Rain, Steam, and Speed, the Great uh, Great Western Rail uh, Railway. Okay, Ruskin and the pre raphaelite poets. Okay, as we were talking about, uh, you know, pre raphaelite poets uh, when we were talking about poets in the later half of the Victorian period. Okay, defend the pre raphaelite brotherhood from attacks in 1850. And you could see like uh, three poets were there in this group pre uh, Raphaelite's poet. One is William Holman Hunt, the other one is uh, John uh, Milleais, and the third one is Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Okay, so we talked about. Uh, them as well okay follow principles of uh, returning to nature so basically they were following uh, the romantic traditions uh, to uh, return to the nature and to follow the themes of which uh, romantic poets they used to follow okay my dear students here this is uh, a publication by you know william holman hunt the light of the world okay so basically here when talk when we talk about um, you know the prose writers of the Victorian era so you could see like uh, he, in, uh, in 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 his different works he also criticized pre raphaelites uh, so basically he was uh, in favor of pre raphaelite poets because uh, they also wanted to uh, you know uh, go for the romantic moment again in the Victorian age as well because they were following the same themes in their poetry okay like the theme of love romance uh, nature about the lives of human beings so basically this is uh, his commentary on pre raphaelite poets okay Christ in the house of his parents by this is basically uh, you know uh, a work by Melis uh, one of the pre raphaelite poets so my dear students here you can see like uh, so my dear students here you can see like it also talked about uh, this work by Melis as well okay Christ in the house of his parents uh, okay this is symbolic as well all right Ruskin Melis and divorce. So, my dear students, here um, you can say like uh, uh, John Ruskin by Melis. So, this is basically uh, this is a publication by Melis, and he wrote about John Ruskin. Okay, takes on Melis as. Uh, 
Crotez traveled to Scotland with Melise and wife Effie in 1853. So this is basically the story of uh, Melise Ruskin and uh, you know Effie. Divorced Effie in 1844. Known. So my dear students here you can say like uh, he uh, divorced Effie in 1854 and uh, you know known consummation over here you can see this heading as well and Effie and Melise marry in 1855. Okay so this is uh, basically the story of Ruskin and Melise. So basically they both uh, were uh, you know um, they all traveled to Scotland okay so uh, he gave divorce to you can say um, his wife Effie in 1854 and right after one year Effie got married with Melise okay so this is basically the story of you know uh, uh, his life okay Meads rose Latouch in 1858 uh, at the age of uh, nine okay proposes marriage one she turns uh, 18 so basically he met uh, you know this lady um, um, rose la in 1858 and at that time she was only nine years old okay and then he uh, proposed uh, her to get married with him when she was 18 years of age they never marry rose dies at the age of 27 after suffering from mental illness so she had that problem and she died around 1877 begins to suffer from a series of attacks of men mental disease so again this is uh, about john ruskin over here okay humiliated in the ruskin versus uh, the whistler trial and he died on uh, you know 20th january 1900 so my dear students uh, i'll tell you Rus ruskin and whistler's trial as well i'll so my dear students this is a trial uh, uh, you know between ruskin and uh, whistler so Rus ruskin accuses whistler of charging 200 uh, guineas for flinging a pot of paint in the public's face okay whistler sues for libel awarded on feathering ruskin damaged mentally emotionally and financially by the experience so basically that was a trial and they had a fight with each other and they had that you can say uh, a dispute uh, uh, between each other so because of that trial ruskin damaged mentally emotionally and financially by the experience okay. so here you can see like a um, nocturne in black and gold uh, that was published in 1874 by james uh, whistler all right okay the work which you can see over here is uh, you can say modern painters okay and the seven lamps of architecture so basically this is uh, here you can find out the description of archi uh, different architects here in this work the stones of venus as well so this is about art and uh, you can say architecture over here okay on society and public you can see like unto this last and force clavergia so this is about uh, different kinds of society and uh, politics in the world okay prateria this is an autobiography graphy so my dear students if you want to analyze Ruskin's uh, uh, work so you, you can take help from his autobiography as well all right so my dear students here you can see Ruskin's legacy influence famous authors and political leaders of that time for example you uh, Tolstoy Marcel Proust Mahatma Gandhi Oscar Wilde so basically these are the authors and the political leaders who were very much impressed by Ruskin okay instituted socialist movement and welfare system okay so uh, basically he had that institution with the name of uh, national trust okay largely dismissed in the early mid 20th century but beginning to be rediscovered and appreciated so my dear students these are some of the points uh, relevant to his life like he was the owner of the national trust plus uh, you know many of the political figures and the famous author there they were also very much impressed by him okay my dear students as you know that we take a start with the essayist of the victorian uh, age today so what happened like uh, we talked about carolyn and then newman and then you know um, about uh, john stott mill and then john ruskin so here you could see like uh, the way they criticize uh, certain poets and the novelists of uh, their era and uh, basically they were against uh, you know the mm, common norms in the society the religious and the political activities which were going on in that society they were very much against it so here you can see like uh, ruskin uh, talked about uh, art architecture and many other things so here you can say like uh, multi-dimensional personalities are here if uh, a writer is uh, talking about essays or he is uh, doing uh, a prose kind of work so do definitely you could see over here like in the victorian period there are certain other dimensions as well poets they are not just restricted to this uh, profession or 
for uh, you know writing poetry only so basically they uh, they are uh, they have very dynamic personalities plus uh, another thing which is very much important like uh, they worked for uh, art for music for architecture for paintings and many other things okay so basically when you talk about essays or uh, when we comment on essays so basically what is an essay this is uh, a kind of uh, an argument sometimes this is uh, in order to compare certain things together sometimes this is in form of uh, you can say persuasive argument in order to convince somebody so basically what uh, essayist or you can say the prose writers uh, did during the victorian era they you know talked about all the novelists all the uh, poets uh, of uh, that very era okay plus one more thing which is very much important is uh, the religious and the political practices which were going on over there so my dear students here this is uh, you can say you can take it in a subjective way only that this is the subjective opinion of some of the authors so here i am talking about the prose writing so whatever any writer is saying so you are not going to trust that person blindly that uh, this is the final word so my dear students what you have to do over here is like where is your opinion about it what is your analysis about any certain kind of thing so whatever they are saying is that is not the final wording so you will have to do your own commentary on it this this that would be your analysis of checking the things of judging the things so you can just build up your background knowledge in order to know about uh, what other people say or you can have a literature review in your research work about for example if you are uh, talking about ruskin's essays or ruskin's other works so basically what you are doing is you are building up you know your background knowledge relevant to any research work but your analysis is very much important okay so my dear students i'm just going to revise few things uh, about the victorian age uh, here again like uh, that was an age of restlessness of chaos so you can say of industrialism as well plus uh, there were some revolutions which were going on and some important things which happened during that era for example like there were certain bills which were passed uh, uh, from the courts uh, about uh, women rights about certain reforms okay so my dear students you, here there you could see like a uh, first half of the uh, victorian period and then the second half of the victorian period as well known as early and later parts of the victorian period so my dear students what you have to do about these two periods like uh, the uh, the prose writers or the novelists or the poets uh, who did their works in the first half of the victorian period how their writings are different from the later half of the victorian period so you'll have to focus on it and plus one more thing like uh, many of the writers uh, they were following uh, uh, you know romanticism still in the victorian age as well and they'll provide basis for the modern period which would be the next uh, you can say era or you can say like the period in the history of english literature okay so how they are providing basis for that period or you can say how they are taking help from the previous ages for example again you could see the revival of the medieval ages over here plus elizabethan some of the concepts from the from the elizabethan poetry you could see over here and still like some of the aspects from the early victorian period a revival in the later half of the victorian period as well romanticism concepts are here like uh, many of the authors they appreciate wordsworth's uh, efforts like uh, his definition of poetry that this is a spontaneous overflow of powerful um, emotion this is not something artificial and then we drew a comparison of a uh, novel and poetry as well and then we compared you know a uh, poet with with an actor so when you are writing something so basically you have to keep in mind that you are the audience you are writing it for yourself and you have this impression in your mind that you are writing it for somebody or a particular people of this from the society so basically you certainly uh, would hide certain things in your mind okay so you won't be that much expressive so by keeping in view that nobody is watching you as an actor on the stage so you are doing it with full emotions with full passion so basically your performance would be different from like if you uh, if you just keep in mind that too many people are looking at you and you cannot perform well so my dear students here what you are supposed to do is that like uh, by keeping in view for example the uh, you know definitions of poetry what aristotle says what uh, wordsworth says or what other people they say or how do they comment on the previous uh, you know era in the history of english literature literature so my dear students you'll have to focus on it and by keeping in view the tradition that when we enter into the new era so basically we uh, in a way we reject the previous era the previous period so this 
is a very common tradition but still there would be certain authors many you can say poets who will be following the uh, traditional patterns okay which were being followed in the last century for example okay and then sometimes you could see the revival of the roman and uh, french literature for example latin literature greek literature as well so what is this all these things they make history okay so by basically the political factors the religious factors the social factors the economical issues which were going on there uh, in any particular society so you'll have to focus on it as far as victorian age is concerned so there was uh, an industrial revolution uh, during that age plus so you can say certain kinds of bills and education was uh, uh, promoted to all the classes of the society so my dear students here uh, there you could see like uh, when people they move from uh, rural areas of country to the urban area the concept of urbanization i told you so there was a shuffling of the classes like uh, many people they became the working class of the society and people those who had land uh, lands in the, you know uh, for example in the rural areas they did not leave their lands and they they were there on their uh, places all the time and they could not uh, get progress in the society so basically these are the trends which you have to keep in mind okay so my dear students today we were talking about victorian essays okay so we are over with it so uh, today's lecture has been taken from you know these uh, sites one is uh, wikipedia okay the other one is uh, you can say like uh, john stott uh, mill critical work okay? you can find out uh, the information from this link and about thomas uh, carlay's writing you can find out uh, again here okay my dear students uh, these are basically not that much well known essays so that is why information is not much available on internet so that is easily available on wikipedia only okay and for the rest of the information you can consult uh, uh, you know a critical history of english literature by david deches or a critical history of english literature by you know uh, dr molek okay that that is all uh, for today hope you are enjoying studying in history of english literature with me so hope to see you again with uh, you know another new topic have a nice day allah hafiz